This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 1882, Why We Don't Micromanage Our Money, by Liz of frugalwoods.com. And I'm your host and personal finance enthusiast, Diana Merriam. Now let's hear today's post as we optimize your life. Why We Don't Micromanage Our Money, by Liz of frugalwoods.com. Want to guess how much time Mr. Frugalwoods and I spend managing our money every month? A whopping 30 minutes. Yes, we are quintessential frugal weirdos. And yes, we save over 70% of our income. And yes, we plan to quit our jobs at 33. And yes, we write this personal finance blog. But no, we don't obsess over our finances. Why? There's nothing to gain by micromanaging our money. Money is happiest as a loner. It wants to be left alone with other money to do its interest-earning thing. The less we mess with our money, the more of it we have. People often assume we employ a ton of time and energy managing our financial empire, but a part of the secret to our success is that we don't. I think it would drive us nuts to constantly think about our accounts and fret over our funds. It would also serve about as much purpose as a greyhound dressed as a bunny rabbit, and it's a lot less adorable. Our money routine. Hint, it's pretty simple. People ask what our secret sauce is for early retirement and how we have so much money saved up. And I hate to disappoint, but the answer is pretty boring. We created a very simple math-based system for managing money and we monitor it regularly, but not fanatically. We don't have one weird trick or some complicated algorithm underlying our fiscal procedures. I think it's very easy to fall into the trap of this idea that the more you fiddle with your money, the better off it'll be. But in reality, we're better off setting it and forgetting it. Our regular money routine involves logging into personal capital to view our credit card and checking accounts weekly to scan for fraudulent charges, check our investments and 401ks to ensure that the automated deposits we've set up are operating correctly, and review all of our expenses once a month. And that's it. We don't constantly adjust our investment portfolio or buy and sell stocks or do bizarre things with credit cards or create complicated budgets with different buckets of money. In fact, we don't budget at all. Instead, we operate from the perspective that we're not going to spend any money. Obviously, we do spend money, but not a whole lot of it. When you start from the idea that you can spend up to a certain budget cap, I think you're almost guaranteed to spend that much. Conversely, if you start from the framework of spending zero dollars, you're less inclined to incur debits against your long-term goals. Spending is like a gas. I guarantee you it'll expand to fill whatever space you give it. So rein in that gas. In the same vein, our frugality is successful because we created frugal habits, which we routinely execute on frugal autopilot. We don't innovate frugality every single day. We just follow the effective frugal lifestyle we've devised. While we do keep our eyes open for even greater frugality opportunities, such as this year's soda stream, coffee, and chest freezer discoveries, these are all the result of seeing the world through a frugal lens, not from obsessively brainstorming new ways to save money. Why we like personal capital. As efficiency optimizers, Mr. Frugalwoods and I are all about anything that streamlines our processes. And this is why we like personal capital. Personal capital consolidates all of our accounts into one place, so we only need to log in once to review our cash monies. Handy and efficient. We can quickly scan our expenses for the entire month, our 401ks, checking account, investments, credit cards, spending transactions, and our mortgage. Personal capital also displays our net worth, income, and portfolio allocations. The only thing it lacks? A greyhound photo of the day. Personal capital also automatically categorizes our spending into graph format, which is a super quick way of seeing where we're allocating the vast majority of our funds. 
usually groceries because we're such ballers. Tracking expenses is, in my opinion, step number one for creating a regimen of high savings. Without knowing where your money's actually going, it's nearly impossible to set concrete savings or debt repayment goals. Stocks, set them and forget them. Mr. Frugalwood says that if he were the benevolent dictator of the world, he'd institute a waiting period on selling stocks. Much like buying a firearm, you'd have to enter a five-day waiting period before you'd be allowed to sell your stocks. This is because people panic, sell low, and then wonder why they're not enjoying the average 7% return on their investments over the long term. We have two portfolios of stocks, our taxable investment account and our 401ks. Our taxable account is invested fully in the low-fee total market index fund, FSTVX. Our overall portfolio is weighted 90% total market index fund and 10% bonds, with the bonds being held in our 401ks in order to maximize tax efficiency. Both of our 401ks are in low-fee index funds as we're staunch believers in avoiding fees whenever and wherever possible. Once a year, we spend five minutes rebalancing our portfolio to match our desired asset allocations. The most important aspect of managing stocks is to choose low-fee index funds and then resist the urge to tweak, tinker, or otherwise do anything with them other than funnel in more money. The only time we follow the market is when we accidentally hear the stock report on NPR's Marketplace. Side note, I do enjoy their sad trombone music for when the market is down, but that's literally the extent of my day-to-day knowledge. Do other things with your time. The more complex you make your finances, the worse off you'll be. Financial companies love creating a smoke and mirrors ambiance for their magical formulas to get you rich quick off their customized portfolios. But the truth is, there's no way to consistently beat the market over the long term unless you're Warren Buffett. We take a straightforward, uncomplicated approach and it works. We don't pay anyone to manage our finances for us and you probably don't need to either. The linchpin of our entire philosophy is that there's nothing to gain from micromanaging your money or your frugality. Earn your money, don't spend too much of it, and invest it. If you want an easy way to quickly check on your dollars every month, use personal capital and log in occasionally to ensure nothing funky is going on. That's it. At the end of the day, it takes a lot less time to save money than it does to spend it. Our society often equates being busy with being productive, and so we feel compelled to busily interfere with our money regularly. But in reality, there's no need. Better to set it, forget it, and use all that saved time to go hiking instead. You just listened to the post titled Why We Don't Micromanage Our Money by Liz of frugalwoods.com. I can appreciate Liz's hands-off approach to money management described here. I found for myself that when I was first cleaning up my finances, learning about money management, and establishing good financial habits, I was micromanaging my money. But over time, as habits and routines were established, I was able to relax a bit. In the beginning, I thought about my money a lot and watched every dollar come in and out. And I think that was necessary at the time because I was building awareness around my finances and working diligently to get out of debt. But things do get easier over time. I found that I needed to think about money until I no longer needed to think about money. Meaning that once my habits were established, money management stopped being top of mind for me and I relaxed into autopilot. I found it easier to relax a bit once I established a sufficient gap between my income and spending and bill pay and investments were automated. Since I track my spending manually, I basically log into my accounts once per month to make sure I captured everything, and then I calculate my savings rate to ensure that I'm maintaining the gap between my spending and income. I appreciated that Liz pointed out in this article that staying on top of your money can be simple and the less complex your systems, the more likely you'll be able to stick with it. 
And that should do it for another edition of Optimal Finance Daily. I'll be back tomorrow as usual, so I'll see you there on the Friday show where your optimal life awaits.